if you're joining us for the first time, or maybe it's been a while since you've be, been here, um, we're doing a series through the Gospels, and we're using a tool called the Harmony of the Gospels. Um, each of the four Gospels contributes to, um, its own unique kind of spin and flavor on, on the events, and when you layer them together, you really get this complete view of the life and ministry of Jesus. And so that's what we've been doing. We've been preaching through this systematically. Um, if you have your own copy, you may discover that if you've been trying to follow along with us, our section numbers aren't quite lining up, and that's okay, right? There's nothing wrong with either edition, but um, there are different versions out there, so just keep that in mind if you're trying to follow along. Uh, I'm going to share something uh, that happened to me recently. Um, this is a, a lunchtime kind of story, and um, I my favorite fruit for lunch is an apple, right? You eat that at the end of your meal, helps clean your teeth, um, gives you that kind of full satiated feeling. Um, so anytime I'm uh, packing my lunch, I just, fingers crossed, I've got an apple in there. So this, like any other day, I'm eating this apple, and I take a bite out of one, and, and it's just like, oh, man, it's just kind of past its prime. It's got that mushy, almost like baked potato texture to it, and you're just like, that's not what I expect when I eat an apple, right? I want it to be crispy and juicy. So I reach over, I'm going to throw it away, and then I don't know why, but I look over at this thing, and to my horror, there's this tiny little white worm. Uh, yeah, you know, um, I'm, I apologize now for, uh, you know, bringing some of that, my pain, in, into your life right now, uh, but good illustrations are hard to come by, and they're tough to waste. Uh, you know, the truth is, I probably could have looked at this apple a little bit closer, but would I have really noticed that worm, right? It's clearly, it was on the inside of the apple. Um, from my eye, there was nothing wrong with it. I would have had to dissect this thing piece by piece and eat it, right? But I, no one's got time to do that for, for a meal. You just grab it and go. Um, you know, most of the time when, when you're growing produce, when you're growing fruit especially, the problem doesn't start with the fruit. It starts with the tree. Um, but even when the tree is healthy, um, we still need to examine the fruit before we eat it. At least we should. You know, we should at least wash it and take the appropriate steps necessary to make sure that what we're consuming is actually good to consume. All right? We shouldn't make the assumption that if it passes the eye test, then it's going to be okay. You know, it's almost like we can apply that mentality to other areas of our lives. Where else have we heard fruit talked about? Well, Paul, for instance, talks about fruit in his letter to the Galatians, right? He talks about the fruit of the Spirit, right? These fruits are the evidence or the outward display of the Holy Spirit's work within the lives of a believer, right? And I'll list them off real quick. They're love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, right? The fruits of the Spirit are supposed to demonstrate the character of a life submitted to God. And in today's text, uh, we're going to learn that we have a responsibility to not only produce good fruit for ourselves, but we need to learn how to discern if the fruit we consume from others is good or bad. Right? We are going to cover a lot of ground in the text. Uh, I'm not going to be able to give every verse a really in-depth look. Uh, what we will be doing is pulling the same string that's woven uh, between the passages here. If you do want to follow along with your Bible, uh, we're not going to be jumping back and forth a whole lot, and I'm going to be starting in Luke chapter 7 at verse 36. Before I start, I'm going to pray, and then we will dive right in. Lord Jesus, we come before your throne this morning um, with our uh, face down on the ground. Lord, we submit ourselves to your word this morning. We just pray that as you um, speak to us today through your word, that it would penetrate areas that need your word. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. So chapter 37, Luke's letter, starting, uh, chapter 7, verse 36, excuse me. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at a table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. 
Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who was touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered, answering, said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. We're going to pause right there for a moment and unpack some of this. So at this point, Jesus was already gaining in popularity. And many of the Pharisees and religious rulers hadn't quite made up their mind about him. So in this instance, uh, Simon the Pharisee, uh, as we read in verse 6, he decided to have Jesus come to his house for a meal. You know, maybe Simon was just trying to get to know Jesus because he was popular among the people. Or maybe this was part of a plan to trap Jesus. But right now, we don't know Simon's motives. You know, whenever a member of the religious community would invite someone into their house to share a meal, it really became a whole community event. The meal itself was only served to the invited guests, but anybody who wanted to attend could do so. So what they would do is they would set up a room for uninvited guests, and these people would observe what was taking place at the meal. Now, I have to ask myself, why would anybody want to go attend a dinner or a meal that they weren't invited to and weren't going to be fed? Right? It, was, um, it was really because uh, it, it, they couldn't stream anything, right? They had no uh, internet. You couldn't, it was the dark ages. I mean, you, it, they had nothing else to do, right? An event like this would have been seen as a form of an entertainment and enlightenment. People would come and see what the rich and powerful were doing, in the cases where there were two or more religious authorities together, right, the uneducated, the, the poor folk, we'll say, had an opportunity to listen to their conversations. And the leaders themselves, you know, the, the, the conversations would, would cover, you know, scripture and current theological trends and other political issues. But the leaders got to show off to the people because they loved to elevate themselves. They got to flex their wisdom and, and the, the intellect that they had. So let's uh, look closely at what takes place. One of the uninvited guests who showed up that evening uh, was this unnamed woman of the city. And we're not told much more about her other than she was a sinner. I think, thankfully, though, Luke, um, and Luke is great about putting in details, and details fill in the context. Right? He's going to give us some details here in a moment uh, that'll give us some insight to who she was. So the text says that she brought an alabaster flask of oil. She stood at his feet, at his feet behind him weeping. She began to wash his feet with her tears, wiped them with the hair of her head, kissed his feet, and anointed his feet with the fragrant oil. In that culture, they didn't use chairs to sit around the table. Um, they would prop themselves up on cushions and you would sit kind of with your feet out on the side of you like you're hogging up half your couch when you're trying to watch something. <laughs> so um, here's this woman who has made her way into an area she wasn't supposed to be in and she starts crying. And the Greek word here is uh, klio and it means to sob and wail out loud. This isn't a silent little weepy cry. Like, she is full on ugly crying at this point. Makeup's running down her face. She's just letting it all out. Um, and as she cried behind Jesus, right, she wasn't, like, behind him, like, she was off to the side of him, and her, his feet would have been right here. She just got her head bowed, and she's crying, and these tears start landing on his feet, and she decides to use her hair to start brushing his feet, getting the, all the dirt. Remember, these people wore sandals. They didn't have shoes and socks like that. Their feet were always dirty. And this is where we can start seeing some of Luke's details come into play. And I do tell our students this all the time, that we need to pay attention to the details that were given in Scripture, because that's what starts unlocking the context of the text. In this culture, when, I, when in public, a woman's hair was normally covered up. But if it was uncovered in public, it was to her shame because long, uncovered hair was the calling sign of a prostitute. A prostitute's hair was a tool of her trade she used to seduce men. And then we also see her anoint Jesus' feet with this oil she had brought with her. Oil was also a tool of the trade of a prostitute. Proverbs 7, verses 16 and 7 indicate that prostitutes use such oil and perfume to adorn themselves and anoint their beds. 
Did you guys catch what's taking place here? This woman is using the tools of her trade to worship and serve Jesus. We need to be glorifying God with our skills. Right? The Bible uh, does say that we are to leave our old lives behind when we come to the cross. But we don't need to leave behind and abandon all these skills and our interests. God gave them to us for a purpose. Yes, we need to stop sinning with them. Uh, we got to stop using our, our skills and abilities in simple ways and instead use them to love Jesus and to bless others. I think of musicians who have played in secular rock music and then they give their lives to Christ and now they're leaders of worship at their church. I know of former members of Hell's Angels uh, that use their love and knowledge of motorcycles to witness to people who are still stuck in sin. There are athletes all over the world who made sports their God. And then when they give their life to Jesus, they use their passion for sports to teach it to children and to share the gospel with them. Sadly, within the church, we still criticize people for their old lives. Right? We pass judgment on people because we don't see them like Jesus does. And that's precisely what we see taking place here in the text. This Pharisee does not see that there's a different kind of love that has captured this woman's heart. Her tears were symbols of her remorse, and her poured out perfume was a symbol of repentance and adoration. And really, to this Pharisee, this was more than he could handle. You see, to the Pharisees, real religious men, the real spiritual guys, they would keep a safe distance between themselves and sinners, or else they would become unclean themselves. Which is why we see him thinking to himself that Jesus were a prophet, he wouldn't allow this woman to touch him. But fortunately for you and I, um, the kind of person that we were or are does not keep Jesus from caring about us. Jesus knew better than the Pharisees uh, what kind of woman she was. And he knew that he needed to show Simon that his opinion about her was wrong. So he decides to tell Simon a parable. Picking back up our text in verse 41, it says, A certain money lender had two debtors. One owned, owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Jesus rebukes the self-righteous Pharisee by noting the selfless love of this woman. You see, Simon did not wash Jesus' feet. She did. Simon did not greet Jesus, Jesus with a kiss. She did. He did not anoint Jesus with oil. She did. The sinner was forgiven, and the Pharisee was not the phrase, he who is forgiven little loves little, may sound like the Pharisee was forgiven a little bit, just not as much as the woman. And he probably thought that. After all, this woman was a sinner, and he was about to eat with Jesus, right? He perceived that he needed little forgiveness, and that her uh, amount owed was impossible. But Simon was wrong. The woman understood her own sin. And that's what caused her to weep at the feet of Jesus. Her heart was full of faith and her eyes were full of tears. She was thinking about her sins, her many sins, and how she had no power to free herself. Her sins were so many that she thought the only suitable place for a great sinner was at the feet of a great Savior. You know, we are just like this woman. Our sins are so many and we have nowhere to go but to Jesus. Uh, we should think like her and not like this Pharisee. You know, he loved little because he thought little of his own sin, but she loved much 
because her sins were many. The greatness of Jesus' forgiveness will always surpass the greatness of our sins. Here, Jesus shows that he is so much more than a prophet, that he was God come in the flesh, and that he came to forgive sinners just like you and me, right? And not just to forgive us, but to give us eternal life through faith in him. The woman's faith was what saved her. She believed in Jesus for eternal life. She heard him speak at some point, and she knew that he was the only way that she could be reunited with God. Certainly now she loves Jesus even even more, and Jesus tells her to go in peace. Um, So after the meal, we're going to continue this story now in Luke chapter 8 in the first three verses. Soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. Now, it would have been really unusual for but not that unusual, I should say, for a rabbi to receive financial support uh, from a wealthy woman. What is unusual and even scandalous is um, for those women who support the rabbi to travel with him. So um, there's a couple things that we're going to pull from this really quickly. And the first, there's a really good word here for us about giving. We don't know how much each of these people made or how much they were able to give. But this is just the way uh, it works in uh, God's economy. Right? Small gifts from unknown persons will often outweigh the big gifts from a very prominent person. Did you know we as a church, we support two full-time pastors. Uh, Kevin and Mike are both uh, supported here. And we also give a great deal of support to other church plants. And that's all because of your generosity Uh, to God's word when it comes to giving, right? Your obedience to that. The fact that we are generous with what Jesus has given us, right? Because he was so generous to us first. The other really interesting thing in this short text is that we have these named women traveling with Jesus. And what's unusual about it, like these three could not have been any further apart in the Judeo social economic ladder. Joanna is the wife of a very important court official. Uh, Herod was the, uh, not King Herod, but he was the uh, Galilean governor, if you will. And uh, Chusa was one of his court, you know, the head of his household. So Joanna would have had many resources to give, and, and she does so. She also would probably have had to give up social standing as well, given that first, women were not support, supposed to support men outside of their family, and two, she decided to follow Jesus. Susanna does not have a noted family member listed uh, by her name, such as Joanna does, but we see that she gives nevertheless, whether she had great means or little to speak of, we don't know. But here's the lesson that we can see from these two. We really have no excuse not to give our all to Jesus. You know, women during this time had little say, um, and at times very little means, but they still surrendered everything they had to him, especially to express gratitude for his work in their lives. And uh, if you didn't know, this, this uh, portion of scripture that we're going through, this is part of what's known as Jesus's busy day. He's been at it for a while, and uh, it's getting late in the day. And what we're about to see here um, is just a continuation of the same day where all these events are occurring. So then he went home, and the crowd gathered again. This is Mark chapter 3, verse 20. Sorry. Uh, Then he went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went outside to seize him, for they were saying he is out of his mind. Can you imagine the crowd that would have to be at your house for you to not even be able to go in and get something to eat? I know at my house, it would take a lot of people uh, to prevent me from going into my own home, to prevent me from doing what I would want to do. But his family were so concerned about Jesus. It's like, he's not stopping. We need to like, we need to stop him. He's going to burn himself out. He's going to hurt himself. Um, And they were so concerned. And in the Greek in this, it's not really clear if these are his immediate family or cousins. 
Um, the, the words that they use there kind of imply that these are just really, really close uh, friends of him, almost like family. Uh, but they were concerned enough about him that they were considering going outside and taking custody of him, like binding him to keep him from going. So in the midst of all this chaos, um, something extraordinary happens. And we're going to pick up this event now in Matthew chapter 12, verses 22. And the, the crowd bring a very uh, particular man before Jesus. Then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and he healed him so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? I didn't include this in my notes if you're reading in that, but this is a very unusual healing because not before, this hasn't happened yet, where somebody was brought to Jesus who was both blind and mute. It's usually kind of been one or the other or other infirmities. So this is a very um, powerful moment because it's not just, you know, one type of healing. There's a complete healing that's taking place here that we haven't seen. And whenever Jesus performed a miracle, there were usually two very different perspectives from the people who observed it. On one side, you have the people who were astonished, and they said, could this be the son of David? You know, these people who were, these were the people who were paying attention to the events surrounding Jesus and the details of the stories that were coming out. Um, they, they were aware of the things that he could do and has done. They were aware of the things that he was saying, how he teached with authority. And it was beginning to feel, fill people up with hope. Right? The hope that at long last their Messiah might be coming to free their people and to reign. But then you have the other side. There were people like the Pharisees who refused to see Jesus for who he was. Matthew 12, 24 says, But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this man cast out demons. And in Mark's gospel, we read in verse 22, And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons, he cast out demons. Now, Beelzebub is a phrase that was used for foreign gods. Um, it technically means the Lord of flies, but the Jews refer to this foreign god as the Lord of the dung heap. Um, so whenever uh, they would utter the word uh, Beelzebub, uh, it was really uh, meant as a bitter word, an insult, and uh, the Jews began to use it as a reference to Satan. So this seems like a very uh, severe act of desperation on the part of uh, the religious leaders. They were bringing a charge against Jesus that could fully ruin his reputation, and it would have been very difficult, if not impossible, to prove them wrong, or at least so they thought. I think they didn't realize who they were up against. So let's read Jesus's rebuke of them from both Matthew and Mark's perspective. Uh, in Matthew 12, first, starting in verse 25, it says, Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid to waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. And in Mark's gospel, it says, and he called them to him, and they said to the and he and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. Notice how Jesus responds here. He doesn't lash back at the Pharisees and scribes. Right? He's not hurling insults at them. Instead, he takes the time to show them their foolishness. If Satan were to cast out his own demons, then he would be committing a civil war. And in the end, his forces would be defeated that much quicker. You know, whenever members of the same team start fighting with one another, that is just the beginning of the end. You know, it would be like you're in the Super Bowl and you are running for the goal line and uh, somebody from your own team tackles you and kind of defeats the whole purpose. Um, or like throwing a slant on the goal line and not giving it to Marshawn. Still stings a little bit. <laughs> 
Then Jesus turned the argument on its head, right? If they wanted to argue that he cast out demons by demonic power, then what was the power by which the Pharisees were casting out demons, right? He doesn't argue that the, the Pharisees weren't actually casting out demons by the power of Satan. He does not literal that, uh, throw that accusation at them. You know, Jesus is assuming that, um, and he's telling everybody, uh, the defeat of the demons was always the work of God. Brother, his point was if they accused him of casting out demons by the power of Satan, then anybody casting out demons was doing the same thing. And Jesus goes on to explain that it is by the spirit, not Satan, that he does his work. And this should be seen as a sign that God's kingdom has arrived. He continues his, um, his response in verse 28. But if it is by the spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. In other words, it's not Satan's kingdom attacking Satan. It's God's kingdom attacking Satan. And that makes a whole lot more sense to the situation. The kingdom of God has always arrived in the person has already arrived in the person of Jesus, and the proof is in the miracles themselves. And Jesus has continued. He's not backing down from them. And then he says this to explain that he has dominion over Satan. Matthew verse 29. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then, then indeed he may plunder his house? Mark says the same thing, but no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Jesus is definitely out casting out the forces of evil. But Jesus even says, I would not be able to do this unless I had the power over Satan to do that. And he gives this illustration of going into a strong man's house, trying to steal his stuff. But the strong man's not just going to let you go in and take his stuff. He's going to try to fight back. He'll try and stop you. You better believe that if somebody comes into my house to steal something and I'm home, they better be bigger, stronger, and better armed than I am. <laughs> All right? you, you have to bind up the strong man first in order to take their stuff. All right? They're not just going to let you have their way. And here is the beautiful part about this. Jesus is declaring, he's demonstrating that he has the power over Satan because he's already defeated them. And he's on his way to even further defeat them. We have to understand this, church. Satan has been bound up by the work of Jesus. Satan is strong, but Jesus is stronger. The kingdom of God has come and the kingdom of darkness can do nothing about it. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So uh, Jesus has defended himself against a false accusation and now it's his turn. Now he is going to go on the offensive here. And he speaks this word of judgment against the Pharisees. Um, you know, this is not the woe to you discourse. That is coming. That is great. But this, this is kind of a, a preview of that, if you will. In Matthew 12, verse 30, we read this, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. And in Mark, his account of this, it says, Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. What Jesus is explaining here for us, we cannot be neutral about Jesus. There's no middle ground here. You're either with him or you're against him. And the Pharisees were certainly not showing that they were with him. And that means they were surely not with God. No one knows God the Father without coming through Jesus. Jesus also either says, if you're gathering, if you're either gathering, you're either doing the work of the ministry, or you're scattering. And parents, you'll understand this more than most people in the room, uh, parents of young children, we know what it's like to have somebody scatter stuff. Have you ever told your three-year-old to pick up their Legos and suddenly the mess has multiplied? Uh, it's the same way with Jesus. You got, we're either working with him, we're working towards a goal, or we're just making things worse. 
And then Jesus shares some good news and bad news in this. The good news is that all kinds of sins and blasphemies can be forgiven. Blasphemy itself, just deliberately mocking or profaning God. That's pretty bad. Um, And yet Jesus says that all types of sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven. He even said that blasphemy against the Son of Man, against Jesus, can be forgiven. But then there is a piece of bad news in this. He says that the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And if this is the one sin that won't be forgiven, we should probably try to understand what's happening. Uh, To understand this, we need to understand the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is meant to draw us closer to God and to ignite us in the work of Jesus. Jesus told us as he was preparing to leave the earth after his resurrection that he would send the Spirit and the Spirit would do great things in us and through us. It is the work of the Spirit that shows us that we need Jesus. It shows us the power of Jesus. It moves us to believe in Jesus and it unleashes the power of Jesus within us. That's what the work of the Spirit is. But here is how we blaspheme against it. Whenever we continually deny the work of Jesus, whenever we refuse to repent and turn to Jesus, we are denying the work of the Spirit. That's when we're blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is a continual, committed rejection of the Spirit's work in leading us to Jesus. Right? You don't commit blasphemy of the Holy Spirit on accident. Right? This is a continued, deliberate rejection of God's work in your life. The unforgivable sin is not murder. It's not suicide. Jesus said it's not even hating and speaking out against him. It's a rejection of God's work in your life. And finally, Jesus is going to give one last illustration to complete his rebuke of the Pharisees. And these verses apply to all believers, not just those who teach the word. Uh, this is Matthew 12, 33 through 37. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, People will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. You know, when Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit concerning false teachers, he was really giving us a guide for identifying them. The false prophets and speakers of lies will have actions that correspond to their errant message. Just as their message is anti-God, so will be their works. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on people, and I'm not as good as the impression as Mike is, but you, you hear about these pastors asking for donations so they can buy jets. Man, uh, the, the fruit that they're producing is not something that we should be following. Right? It goes contrary exactly to what um, the message, what the word says. How do you tell if a tree is good or bad? You look at the fruit. Right? You don't just dig up the roots buried under the ground because you don't have to. You can just look at the fruit that it's producing, and that'll tell you everything that you need to know. In the same way, our words reveal our hearts. How do you know what was in the Pharisees' hearts? Just listen to their words. They accused Jesus of being empowered by Satan. That should tell you everything that you need to know about the Pharisees. Right? They weren't evil because of the words they spoke. Rather, the words they spoke revealed the evil that was already in their hearts. Jesus says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Or as I've heard it said once before, what's in the well of the heart comes up through the bucket of the mouth. <laughs> if you have good things stored in your heart, then good things are going to come out of your mouth. If, if bad things are coming out of your mouth, that means you have bad things stored up in your heart. Your words reveal your heart. Have you ever spoken a careless word? Have you ever said something you wish you could take back? Well, of course you have. We're human. We all have done this. Um, But there are no excuses on Judgment Day. 
each of us will have to give an account for all the words that we have spoken. And I think you would agree these are some pretty strong verses. Uh, Jesus warns us that our words are powerful and we should take them very seriously. Our words truly, truly matter. So what can we take home from all of this? I think for the first thing, Jesus is calling each of us to be very mindful of the things that we say. He wants us to be producers of good fruit because that fruit goes out into the world and we, we bring it to our friends and our family and we, we want to give them a meal that is going to benefit them, that is going to help grow them. But our fruit cannot be good unless the tree is good. And friends, we're the trees. So what does your speech reveal to others? Are you a person who is positive in your speech or a person who is known to speak negatively? Does your speech reflect a language that is Holy Spirit driven or influenced by a sinful nature? There was one detail in these passages that I intentionally skipped over until just now. Jesus knows what's in our hearts and minds. And I don't know if that should scare us or encourage us. Um, When we look back at Simon the Pharisee at the very beginning, it says that he was thinking to himself. Jesus was aware that he didn't say anything out loud, and yet Jesus had a response. He knew that the woman was truly acting out of repentance. It wasn't just for show, right? Jesus knew that the scribes and Pharisees were accusing Jesus of of using the power of Satan, even though they were not even around him. They were away. It said that the scribes were coming down. Jesus was able to perceive all of that. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of us, of soul and of spirit of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So I'm going to wrap things up with this last thought, and Kevin and the team are going to start coming down, and we're going to um, uh, have them lead us in one last song. But I want to send you home with this thought. We carry the Holy Spirit within us. And the Holy Spirit gives believers the power to live like Jesus and to be bold witnesses for him. You know, his work in us makes us more and more like Jesus. He gives us power and love and self-discipline. When we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, he will guide us in the direction we need to go. He will pull us away from the things that we have in our lives that don't please him. And the point is, when, when the Holy Spirit is at work in your life, it is going to be evident all around you. Let's pray Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your love, your grace, your word, and we just ask that this uh, this day would be a turning point for some of us. You know, it is a, a day that we have taken communion. It was a moment that we paused to reflect on if there is sin in our lives, but, you know, as your word has led us this morning, um, we need to keep pausing and keep examining our lives just to make sure that we are producing good fruit. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Bearing fruit in the Christian life is not about doing works or attempting righteousness in our own strength. Rather, it is about intentionally growing in our walk with Christ, inviting the Holy Spirit's power into our lives to transform our lives. If we truly seek Him and lay down our our fleshly desires for His better ways— We're going to start bearing fruit that is lasting and it'll serve as salt and light into a world in need of Jesus. Emmaus Road Church, you are sent.